Lords, my Lords, my Lady, almost finished with the decision letter uh, yeah. before I turn on to the sixth of my sixth uh, heading. Yeah. Um, but before the short adjournment, my Lady asked for an example of a scenario in which the construction of a dwelling house would be of a nature and scale that would exceed um, that which, which might be said to be integral to or part and parcel of a material change. Mm. So my first, first line of that answer is, is that in the end, that would be a, it's a question of degree, a question of, you know, a, a degree, a, um, a judgment for the decision maker. So there's no, if you like, there's no perfect answer. On the other hand, trying to assist the court with something that looks like an example. If the court were to turn up supplementary bundle, uh, tab seven, page one, two, five. Did I say page 44? Sorry, tab 7, page 44. So sorry, I was looking at the wrong... 44. I bet I was looking at the wrong page number. Page 44. Yeah. T tab 7. Um, there should be uh, a figure, figure 3, the planning units on the site. And I've touched on this mm. figure already. Mm. Th this, just for, to remind the court, th this, these were the various planning units said at the time of the appeal by the now respondents to exist on the site. There's, as the court seen already, that was something that was dealt with the, by the inspector under the ground B uh, appeal. But, but for the purposes of, of answering my lady's question, uh, illustratively, let us say that the relevant planning unit was restricted to Goose House and to its immediate curtilage, to, if you like, the, on mine it's a sort of bluey area, the, the residential curtilage, which was what was said at the time of the appeal by my learned friend on behalf of the... Um, on behalf half of the respondents. Let us say that the relevant planning unit um, which um, which went through a material change of use to residential was only that much smaller area. Mm. In that case, if the building were somewhat larger than it, than it in fact was, as, as the court seen, it was a single story building of timber construction um, and of a modest scale, so the inspector thought, but anyway, were it a larger building and were the, um, were the um, unit within which it sat, the planning unit, much more constrained uh, 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 of the sort that, you know, of the sort that is set out here in the blue, the, 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 the light blue um, line. I accept that in those sorts of circumstances, it may well be difficult for a decision maker rationally to reach the view that um, the construction of the dwelling house is, is only um, integral to and part and parcel of a change of use rather than the construction of the dwelling house being, in fact, the principal development that's happening within this planning unit. So it depends on the size <coughs> of the planning unit? It depends on the size of the building and the size of the planning unit and the interaction between the two. The nature and scale of, of, of both of those things. Yeah. On the decision letter, mm. the only other thing that I just wanted to, I think, correct is that I said that the in, we were concerned, that the court should be concerned only with what's described as Appeal A, right on the front page of the decision letter. The decision letter is tab 26 of the core bundle, page 247. What I should have said is, is that the court's concerned with Appeal A insofar as the enforcement uh, appeal goes, which is the section... 174 appeal, which led to a section 289 appeal before the judge below. But there's also a link, and they rise or fall on precisely the same issues, appeal that relates to a certificate of lawfulness to retain the building, and that's yeah. appeal C. Yeah. So actually, it's appeal A and appeal C, although the reasons for upholding one or the other are, are identical, because they go to the same issues of lawfulness. So in the end, what I say about, in particular, paragraphs 18 and 19 are that we see there, this is again on page 252 where we left off just before lunch, we see there a rational application of the statutory framework and indeed uh, a rational application of the relevant tests the inspector had to apply, correctly understood from in particular Kestrel and Murphitt. In particular, and most of all, on the finding in the first sentence of 19, on the principal form of development. I don't say that that was the only answer rationally open to the inspector at 19. 
but I do say it was it was a rationally open it was it was an answer that was rationally open to him on the facts of this um, on the facts of this case, and that was the answer that he reached. So uh, I turn sixth, sixthly and finally um, to make some submissions on the approach taken by the learned judge at first instance below. And I'll make four key submissions on her judgment. The judgment, I uh, know the court will have this already, but it's at tab 12 of the core, core bundle is the judgment of Mrs Justice Leaven. I'll make four uh, key submissions on her uh, judgment. I'll, I'll just say what they are now and then I'll develop each one in turn. So the four key submissions are, firstly, she fails to analyse what on my case is the central part of the statutory scheme, which is to say the local planning authority's responsibility to identify and explain the nature of the breach of planning control, see sections 172 and 173 of the, of the Act. 172 and 173? Yes. That's the first thing. The second, and flowing from the first, having omitted that analysis, the judge appears, appears, and I say impermissibly appears, to try to identify the nature of the breach of planning control herself. Uh, third, the judge's suggested principle of law at, in particular, para 39, where she draws it together, is not analytically coherent. And fourth, and finally, she failed to consider the mischief that her approach perpetuates, which is the issue of um, useless buildings. So, take those in turn. First, then, the omission that I, what I say is an omission in the judge's approach to the statutory scheme. Now, if the court has uh, the judgment, uh, the, the judge turned to the legislative scheme on, um, from paragraph 10, which is on page 98. And she sets out its key, or some of its key, key components and, des and describes, uh, describes what, they, what they say. Having reviewed them, Having reviewed that, she goes on to consider the case law, and in particular the, ju the judgments in Murphitt and um, the judgment of my lord, the senior president in Kestrel. Uh, she reaches her conclusions hmm. from paragraph 32. And that that uh, paragraph is on page 105 of the uh, bundle. Mm -hmm. She begins at 32 by endorsing the submissions of my learned friend and saying that the issue is what are the limits or parameters of the power to require the restoration of, the, of land under section 172.3. She says that the... Uh, I think she must mean 173.3 because it's not in section 172.3 but nothing turns on, on that. Um, we've seen what the the power to require steps in order to achieve the purposes of, of restoring land, that those, that, that's all set out in section 173. The starting point, she says, must be the statutory scheme. Uh, the judge goes on to section 173.3, which allows uh, the, the, the authority to require the restoration of land to its condition uh, before the breach took place. And she goes on thereafter to, at the end of uh, paragraph 32, section 171b, which is to say the, the time limits, the, the four-year four, four year, four year, uh, limit that, that I've shown the court. She goes on to, she repeats the reference to 171b at paragraph 33. And that, and that, so far as the conclusions go, that's it in terms of her analysis of the statutory scheme. She then goes on to consider Kestrel uh, in particular and Murphitt uh, in, in the subsequent paragraphs. The, the analysis of the statutory scheme in the judge's conclusions omits a central, I say it's the central step in this part of the statutory scheme, it is the central step. 
It is the step at 172 subsection 1 and 173 subsection 1 of the Act, on which I've made submissions already, provisions which require the authority to decide, and having decided, then to tell us, to state, what it appears to them to be the nature of the breach of planning control. And indeed, my Lord, the Senior President described that as a central uh, part of these provisions at paragraph 24 of Kestrel, it, which, it, which it is. We, we, that, that, that's certainly our submission. But, but it's not a step in the process that is analysed in the judge's conclusions. Omitting that analysis and viewing the statutory scheme as the judge does, primarily through the lens of 171B, which is to say the time limits for enforcement, allows, we say, the tail to wag the dog, because we are there only concerned, as I've said, uh, as I've submitted earlier, with an important question, but an question that simply goes to whether or not a breach can be enforced against it. It doesn't help us with the anterior question, with the logically prior question of, well, what is the breach in the first place? The judge does not consider the, how those provisions operate in this part of the statutory scheme. The second of my four submissions on the approach that the judge takes, is having not, not, not gone there, having, having not considered the way that that part of the statutory scheme works, the judge appears, appears impermi impermissibly, I say, to try to identify the real nature of the um, the breach of planning control herself in, in, in the judgment. And I say that because at 37, the judge notes that the case that comes closest to the present on the facts is Lullen Hatfield. Comments of, uh, she goes over the comments of Lord Justice Richards and Lord Mans over to the reservation expressed by Lord Justice Richards is precisely the same reservation as arises here. An attempt to use an enforcement notice, she says, uh, over, the to over the page, an attempt to use an enforcement notice limited to a, mature, a material change of use by reason of the fact that the operational development can no longer be directly enforced against to achieve removal of the principal operational development here the dwelling house is in my view going contrary to the statutory scheme. Now perhaps what's, what is happening there could be, could be clearer the judge appears to be suggesting her own view, her own, if you like, finding on what the principal development here in this case is, which is to say op the operational development, the dwelling house. The, the court will recall the, 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 the word principal development appears in the decision letter too, at, at paragraph 19, where the inspector had decided that as a matter of fact and degree on all of the evidence that was before him, the principal development uh, was not this at all. It was the material change of, it was, would be, it was the material change of use. And the court will also recall... Change of use isn't a development. It is, my, my lady. It is a, it's a, a change of use is one of the two sorts of development, one of two sorts of development recognised by the statute. So the, the term development is is perhaps or perhaps uh, perhaps misleading to some. It's a, it, it's a term that has a, a technical meaning defined in the statute, so as to include both buildings, operational engineering works, and also simply the material change of use of land. Putting all building works aside, that of itself could be development. So um, the the inspector's finding uh, was, as I've shown the court already, that the principal form of development in this case. She's not fact. saying the principal development, she's saying the principal operational development. Yeah, that's why I say, I, I appreciate that, my lady, and that's why I say it could perhaps be clearer. So it does depend on how one reads that sentence. Uh, my reading of it, although I... Doesn't it mean main building? My, my submission is, is that what she's doing is finding that there is a principal development and it is operational development, it is the dwelling house. But if the court doesn't think that that's what she means, then this is not an error that she's fallen into. If she does, if and to the extent that then she does find what the principal development is here against what the inspector has found, that would be a surprising approach given that she has not, see paragraph 40, gone into or challenged or accepted any challenge in relation to the rationality of the inspector's decision at, at paragraph 19 or anywhere else in the decision letter. So no challenge to rationality addressed in this judgment for the reasons she explains at, at, at 40. So I appreciate my lady's point. That's why I've, I've 
tried to be careful to say it appears to be. That did, I say it appears on my, on my understanding of what the judge is doing at 37. Um, to be, if, if and to the extent that she is reaching a view on what the principal development was here, she, 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 that, that is not an appropriate thing to do um, because that is exclusively subject to rationality uh, and other you know, traditional public law grounds a matter for the decision maker, certainly not, 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 not for the court to do, if you like, on the merits. That's the second of the four. But rationality was in play before her. It was she in play. She just didn't decide it. That's right, my lord. She absolutely could have gone on, uh, had yes, she felt Mr it. Edwards was saying it was irrational. He, he was. But she didn't. She didn't feel the need to go there. She, having decided the first point, she didn't go on and deal with the second Exactly, point. that's right. Yeah. That's absolutely right. Third of four, um, the judge ends up uh, deriving a principle. I, I characterise it as a principle. Uh, it's, it's her understanding of the way that the um, case law and the, the, the uh, statutory framework operates. Um, paragraph 39 in particular is where the, the, the principle is crystallised. Uh, the judge says that in her view, both the statute itself and the case law point to a limitation on the power described in Murphitt, where the operational development is itself the source of or fundamental to the change of use. She says that whether that limitation is reached is a matter of fact and degree. But the inspector here erred in not appreciating that there was that limitation there at all. Uh, and, 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 and that was where that was where things went wrong. Well, that, that is, <coughs> that are, as I read it, that is tantamount to her concluding that the inspector misdirected himself on That's, the Murphy principle. That is, as I read it, too, my lord. That's, that, that is, that is the nature of this finding. And so, I make some submissions about, in particular, that first sentence of paragraph of paragraph thirty nine, and whether or not the understanding that the judge has or the way that she expresses her understanding of what the principle is there is correct. To take it in, in stages, um, take first the idea of operational development being fundamental to the change of use. I'll come back to the idea of source in a moment. But to just start with that use of the term fundamental to. To take a step back, on this approach, building work could fall into the Murphitt principle if it were integral to a material change of use, but must fall outside the Murphitt principle if it is fundamental to a material change of use. With, with great respect to the learned judge below, that, that, that is not a distinction that is coherent. In, integral means something necessary for the completeness of the whole, something which is a necessary part of the whole. Fundamental means something which is essential, something which is necessary. Recalling, and I don't need to, but recalling this court's repeated warnings over many years about the over-legalisation of the planning system, and trying to be realistic about this, the terms are, in effect, almost completely synonymous. Which terms are, sorry? The terms of, of being integral to and fundamental to. The terms of identical and fundamental. Sorry, integral. I'm sorry, my lord. Integral to and fundamental to. Yeah, Those maybe. two terms are the terms that I'm saying are essentially synonymous. Maybe you said integral and I misheard you. Sorry, uh, I, I may have mis mis misspoke. Integral and fundamental. So integral being, I'm taking integral from the, from the, from the in the end, from Simon Brown's submission that was picked up in Murphitt. Um, and fundamental to I'm taking from 39 of the judgment. The, 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 on, on the judge's approach, integral, if you like, is, is potentially acceptable under Murphitt, potentially. Fundamental, absolutely not acceptable under Murphitt. And I say that that's not coherent at f first, because in reality, trying to resist over-legalisation, which might, might be an ironic thing to say at the end of these submissions I've been making, but um, the... the they are synonymous terms. They mean I know, their, their meanings are not truly synonymous, but in effect, they mean the same thing. They mean things which are necessary in order to you know, facilitate the, the rest of, of the whole. If operational development 
is integral to a change of use, see Murphitt, it will be fundamental to a change of use. A Murphitt on the facts is a good example to illustrate this. The hard core removed in that case, or to be removed in that case, was not only figuratively fundamental, it was literally fundamental to the change of use, because of course what fundamental really does mean is laying the foundations for, for whatever it is that's to come. And in, in, if, if the change of use, if the hard core is not fundamental to that change of use, then, uh, the, the, then what is? It, it, it was. It was integral to the change of use. It was also fundamental to the change of use. The distinction between these terms, integral and fundamental, if there is one, is not an analytically coherent basis to carve out a new principle or to refine the existing principles of law to justify quashing what would otherwise have been uh, a, an impeccable, we say, understanding of the principles set out in Kestrel Hydro. That's my submissions on the, the, the use of the word fundamental. Turning next to the idea of uh, a building being the source of a change of use, which is the first part of that, of that final clause in 39. To the extent that this term touches on the judge's characterization of a principal development from which other things flow, I've made submissions on that already, um, it goes along with what I've already said, the second of my four submissions about um, the judge's uh, undue interference with what are in the end planning judgments for the inspector, to the extent that 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 is what's going on with the use of the word source. Uh, but more generally, there's a problem with this language of source. And indeed, it's the same problem uh, that exists with the use of the word uh, causative. Because at, um, at, at paragraph 35, a few paragraphs up, uh, the judge goes over Murphitt and Kestrel Hydro and says in the fourth line that in those cases, operation development was not fundamental to, I've addressed the court on that already, or causative of the change of use. So clearly she's, she's gesturing towards the idea of, a, of, 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 of buildings which are, or building works which are the source of a change of use, the causative of the change of use, and that's what she's seeking to capture at 39. The problem is something that I've touched on already but will develop a bit more now, that buildings, to use a shorthand for building works, other sorts of operational development. They don't cause material changes of use. The cause of, or the source of, a material change of use analytically is when the use changes, which sounds like a, like a, perhaps a trite truism, but it is in fact, it's, it's important. Um, it's, you don't necessarily need actual day-to-day -day use, and this is something that Lord Mans went into, looking at the MP line of authority in the Welland Hatfield case from 27 to 29, we don't need to take the court to unless it would assist. But the point in that case, it was held that not necessarily actual use, a prospective, imminent, intended use might be enough. But, but it matters not for these purposes, because in the end, the source of, the cause of, a material change of use is use, actual or imminent. It's use. It's people using it. It's not the building. Or indeed the hardcore or the huts or, or whatever. The, uh, what the operational development more generally. That's not the way it works. So in the end, the principle that the judge seeks to uh, describe at 39 and then criticise the inspector for failing to observe uh, is, is unsupported by, and we say is inconsistent with, the approach of this court in Kestrel and indeed with the statutory scheme more widely. Fourth, and finally, in uh, these submissions on the judgment, the judge doesn't consider or analyse the mischief that her approach perpetuates. She does not, and in the end it's, it's well to remember, of course, albeit that we are working in the context of a detailed statutory scheme. Murphitt and indeed Kestrel are common law, got common law principles that the judiciary are, are applying in the context of that scheme. And so the consequences of applying them are irrelevant to how they're framed. But isn't it a necessary concomitant to the fact that you've got two time limits so that you could have a building 
sitting yes. there that can't be used. I mean, it's just part of the scheme. That, that's one of the things. That <coughs> I'll, I'll address that in just a moment. That is obviously that's one of the things that Mr. Edwards says against me is, is that that's just it comes with the territory, if you like. Mm. That's what, the way that the scheme is designed. I will come on to that in just a moment. Um, at 56 of their skeleton, um, the respondents anticipate this issue and they make four points and I will respond to each of them. And I think the first of those Just four, before you do, oh, what, is the, what is the mischief that she I'm sorry, well, look, yes, of course, I should have said. Before we I, go I, to no. what they say about why it isn't, the, the, can the, I just the, know what it is? Yes, it is securing a useless building in perpetuity in the Greenbelt, where you have uh, an in principle a definitional harm caused by the intrusion of built form. This is the sort of quote nonsense, or not my word, but, the, the, but the, to, to pick up on the term of Mr Justice Stephen Brown, that led to, in Murphy, the court trying to solve this problem, trying to square this circle, uh, in the way that they did. But why would it be a useless building? Because the on 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 my learned friend's approach, and indeed on the judge's approach, the, the consequence of all of this, of the judgment, is, is that the building itself is immune from enforcement, so stands, as it were, literally and metaphorically yeah. stands. The building remains. However, the building's use as a, as a, as a house, or, or whatever, as a dwelling house, is unlawful and has been successfully enforced against, and, and that's not, 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 not being challenged. So you have a, you have a building, it's, it's physically there, it's in place, and on the, on the approach and the judgment that, that's urged on the court by my learned friend, the building stays, but it can't be used for anything, unless and until something else happens. There might be future planning applications. Well, unless an application is made. Of course, of course, that, and of course that might happen. I'll come on to that. But that's the mischief. So for now, the status quo would be that the building is there, but I described it earlier on as a, as a ghost building, in that it cannot lawfully be put to any use. And that is a mischief that the courts have recognised for decades, or over 40 years since, since, since Murphy. And that was the sort of, as I've said, that was a different case, Murphy, obviously on the facts, but that was the kind of nonsense, that was the, the nature of the nonsense that the judge was, was, was referring to. You've, you've achieved your enforcement against the use, but the land physically remains at you know, in that case, with the hardcore on it, you know, as it as it was when it when it had HGVs parked all over it. In that case, that's the problem. Uh, and as I say, the the um, respondents anticipate that problem and and um, seek to resp uh, re respond to it in the skeleton. They do that in. I don't know whether the court has the skeletons separately, but the skeletons are in the war <coughs> bundle. And the part that, that I'm after is on page 84 of the, the core bundle. Yes. Paragraph. Yeah, you're, you're now responding in anticipation. To I am, just very briefly. And then not I'm yet actually orally made. Yes, um, that's right. And right. it may be that then it's not, it's uh, not necessary. Well, no, I mean, I, I don't think we should stop you doing it, but uh, I'm going to ask you at this point, how, how much longer do you I've, think? Um, under, under five minutes. Right. So the uh, f 56, para 56, which is on page 84 of the bundle, uh, this, is, this is in the skeleton argument of the respondent. And there are four reasons given. Not reasons in the judgment, obviously, because the judge doesn't consider this, but four reasons given as to why, um, uh, the, 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 why the, the above approach, uh, w it's not accepted that the above approach would lead to an unacceptable, to unacceptable use of this. The first is the, that, and this is to pick up on my lady's point, that, that that is just the way it goes. That's the logical consequence of the basic distinction in the legislative scheme, that there might be useless buildings. I do accept that there are, at least at the moment, cases where this kind of position might theoretically arise. It cannot be excluded as a, as a, as a potential outcome of the statutory scheme. But one of the core rationales of, of Murphit of the Murphy principle, if you like, being designed and, 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 and described in the way that it was. One of the core rationales of the restorative power in the statute is to avoid this kind of thing happening insofar as, it, as possible in cases in particular where building works are, in, are integral to a material change of use. Second, it's said that the problem ought not to be exaggerated. That's at, at, at B. 
It's unclear why not. It, it, in this case, we're talking, as I've said, about a site in the metropolitan green belt, the general and long-standing presumption in national policy against new buildings, and we've got the relevant authority trying to resist attempts over many years to secure built form on this land for, for, for decades now. So it is, it is a, it's, I, we don't accept that it's a problem that, that, that is, there is a risk of, of exaggerating. It is a serious issue um, which the authority has sought in the various ways that it has to, to, um, to stop. Third, except in the most obvious way. Except in one of the ways that it could, I accept except that. Except in the most obvious way, because yeah. otherwise, I mean, we wouldn't be here if we didn't have a statute that had two different periods. Mm -hmm. That that may be, but I that mean, that's it, I, I, this is the court. I don't demure from that. Don't demure from that. But that that's not a necessary plank of my argument because no, it's not a necessary plank of your. You're right. You're right. Of course. But it, but it's it's why we're here because if if it was ten years for both, as it sounds as if one day it might be, then then th th there wouldn't be an issue. But, but that, on the other hand, since 1992, did you say? I did. 1992. Yes. Um, um, uh, the four-year point yes. is obviously something that's designed to, fingers crossed and all these other things being equal, give some certainty. Yes. I, I, I don't demure from any of that, but, but I do say that the real reason we're here, uh, as it were, is that is that we've got an inspector who defined what the principal form of development was in his in his opinion. Well, I understand that. I understand um, that. But, but I appreciate that obviously has knock-on consequences for, yeah. time, for time limits. I, I, the, reason, the only reason I'm qualifying my answer in that way is because one of the things that I am criticising the learned judge below for doing is, again, with, with the greatest of respect to her, obviously, um, but criticising her approach and the conclusions for doing is for looking, to, for looking at the statutory scheme very much through the prism of time limits, rather than working through it in the way that I've suggested it should be done, and 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 focusing on taking it almost in sequence, in the sequence that I did earlier, because the time limits, important though they be, of course they are, they don't help us, as I've said already. I'm not, I'm not I'm already at the end of my five minutes um, of that, um, that 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 primary exercise of judgment. The third of the um, points made uh, at C uh, mm. is that. Uh, Planning permission could be sought in the future to regularise the use. There could be repurposing. There could be a fallback scenario. But again, this shows how problematic the idea of a ghost building can be, because it can, be it can become, in effect, a Trojan horse. So the key issue in Greenbelt terms is the effect of built form on openness. Establishing that a building is beyond enforcement, even a building with no lawful use, appears to have been a, a, a core purpose of the respondent's enforcement appeal. Once the built form's there, they now tell the court, we can try and regularise its use. And of course, the authority may in due course, who knows, have weaker grounds to object to an application now, because the principal harm to openness has already happened. And in this way, the strong presumption in national policy um, against this sort of thing in the Green Belt can be nimbly sidestepped. And finally, at D, it is said that the building can be removed, uh, relying on section 102, not a section I've spent long on, um, of, the, of the Act, subject to statutory controls, which, of course, it can theoretically, but that is a power, an, an extreme power, very rarely used, because it's, no, it's a power that brings with it the requirement for Secretary of State confirmation, and most importantly, for cash-strapped local authorities. It's a power that brings with it um, the liability for compensation, which in a case like this could be a very significant liability uh, indeed. So it's, it's, it's not an answer, and indeed it is also one of the submissions that was made um, in the Kestrel Hydro case um, in aid of a submission that Murphy was bad law altogether. Mm. My lords, my lady, that was all I'd intended to say, <laughs> um, unless obviously I can assist the court any further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you. Mr. Edwards. My lords, my lady, um, so far as my submissions by way of response are concerned, um, I'll present those submissions under the following heads. Firstly and briefly, one or two additional factual matters to um, the issue in the case and the respondent's headline response to the issue. Thirdly, the legislation. Fourthly, the case law. Fifthly, what we submit to be the limitations 
to the application of the Murphy principle and uh, latterly the decision letter and judgment taken together. Yes. Um, dealing with then the first of those matters, so far as the facts are concerned, um, the facts have been opened fully by um, Mr. Simons. There's very little I need to add by way of additional submissions, but I do make the following points. Uh, firstly, and by way of reinforcing the uh, position explained to the court by Mr. Simons, um, the facts concerning the commencement of the erection of the Goose House, its substantial completion and its first occupation in uh, May of 2014 were all common ground before the inspector. I don't ask the court to turn it up, but in the supplementary bundle mm. at page 28 is the st an extract from the statement of common ground mm -hmm. uh, entered into between the planning authority and the appellant. And on page 28 at paragraphs 8.7 to 8.10, matters relating to the completion and the immunity from enforcement as operational development of the Goose House is recorded as common ground. Mm. The only additional factual matter that I would raise concerning the construction and occupation is that the occupation of the building was taken up by an employee of uh, the second respondent, Timberstore, in May 2014, and he and his family have remained in occupation of the dwelling house at all times since, and indeed remain in occupation now. Uh, so far as the enforcement notice appeal is concerned, um, as has been uh, explained to the court and as is recorded in the material before the court, the appeal proceeded under five grounds uh, and they were presented and dealt with by the inspector in this order. Appeal B, the basis that no breach of planning control had taken place. The appeals under ground D and F, which are uh, the central ground of both before the High Court and this Court concerning the Murphy Principle, they were dealt with together. The Ground A appeal and then the Ground G appeal, the latter being the extension of time for compliance. I can just take a moment just to explain briefly the context of the Ground A appeal and the way it was advanced. Uh, the uh, respondents at no stage contended that the use of the Goose House and the surrounding land for residential purposes was lawful by reason of immunity from enforcement. The enforcement notice had been issued within a 10-year period of that use commencing, and therefore it was not lawful. And that, that was conceded? That was, that was conceded. So the Ground A appeal and the deemed application for planning permission only sought permission for that use and only sought that permission if we succeeded on the Ground D and Ground F appeal in the sense that if the Goose House, as operational development, was immune from planning enforcement and could not be removed, in those circumstances, the respondents then sought planning permission for the continued use of that building and the surrounding land. And the reason, my Lord, being is that a pragmatic decision was taken by the respondents that they would not succeed in securing planning permission for a new building in the Greenbelt. It was only the use, therefore, that was being sought on that contingent basis. It was only if the Ground D appeal succeeded. Only if the Ground D and Ground F appeal succeeded. D and F. D and F. And Lord, the reason why D and F were taken together uh, is essentially the, the, the position was being put that um, one of the matters alleged in the enforcement notice, namely the building of the, the dwelling house, itself as operational development was immune from enforcement, and that seeking to include a requirement for its removal went beyond, as a matter of principle, what could be achieved through the Murphit approach. And that was the Ground F, essentially. And Ground F, as your Lordship is aware and your Lordship is aware, goes to whether the steps required by the enforcement notice exceed what is necessary. And we say it did, because it exceeded what could be done through the application of the Murphit And indeed, the inspector approached the determination of those grounds, those two grounds of appeal in that way. Uh, and ultimately, on the facts, uh, a question was raised by the court, well, did the local planning authority give any explanation 
as to why they took no enforcement action between the date on which they were alerted to the construction taking place in January 2014 uh, and 2018 and thereafter. Well, they were certainly asked the question, both in cross-examination by me and indeed by the inspector, and no answer or explanation was forthcoming. In fairness to the local planning authority, the two witnesses that appeared were not officers during that period. They did disclose the enforcement files during that period, and the enforcement files uh, revealed no explanation as to why the local planning authority took no action. And latterly, and very briefly, uh, so far as the issue of concealment is concerned, it's been rightly conceded on behalf of the Secretary of State that that formed no part of the inspector's decision letter, nor did it. It didn't form part of the local authority's case, and the local authority at the very early stages of the public inquiry were asked to confirm that um, they uh, were not uh, suggesting any concealment in this case. And indeed, and I don't need to go into it, Mr Caldwell, in his evidence, explained why the fencing had been put up around the site, um, insofar as that um, was in any way suggestive of concealment taking Anyway, it formed part of no part of the authority's case. I turn then, if I may, to the, to the issue as we see it. Uh, the issue uh, in our submission in this case is whether there is any in principle legal limit to the application of the well established Murphy principle, and if there is, whether the inspector exceeded that limit in his decision. And that is, we would submit, the issue that the court needs to decide in this case. Is there any in principle limitation, do you limitation. say, in on the Murphy principle? The Indeed, the Lord, of the Murphy. And the application of the Murphy principle. Indeed. Any in principle legal limit to the application of the Murphy principle, and did the inspector exceed that in this case? Now, by way, Lords and Lady, of just headline responses to that point. Firstly, uh, we cannot realistically, in light of Kestrel Hydro, and do not challenge in principle the Murphy principle or approach. And we therefore accept that as a matter of principle, a planning enforcement notice directed at a material change of use of land may require works comprising building operations or operational development, or works which are not development at all, to be removed as part of the steps required by that notice to be taken. And the power for an enforcement notice to do that is, as the authorities make clear, derived from the remedial power in section 173, subsection 3 and 4A. However, we would submit that the judge was right and that there are legal limits to that power. And those legal limits are these, that what that power cannot do is to require the removal of a building where the building itself has generated Just take this more steadily. The building itself has generated the material change of use or, as Mrs Justice Lieben put it, paragraph 39 of her judgment where the operational development itself is itself the source or fundamental to the change of use. Essentially those are, the, it's the same point in my submission as to whether the building generated the change of use. They're the same point aren't they? They are the same point. I mean I put the point before Mrs Justice Lieben that the, the, thresh, the legal threshold, the legal limitation was you can't require, using Murphy, the removal of a building that has generated the change of use. She wasn't, let's say, comfortable with putting it in that way, and therefore recast the limitation in the way that she did in paragraph 39. What, in my submission, the case law demonstrates, and what is the extent of the Murphy principle, is that it can through an enforcement notice directed at the material change of use, secure the removal of building works or other operational development that is associated, ancillary, or incidental. Associated, ancillary, or incidental to the change of use. 
and those are the phrases that have been used variously in the cases. All of those words are in the cases. They are all in the cases, Lord, and I'll come to those. What is also in the case law is a reference to works that are integral uh, to and part and parcel of. And in my submission, what integral to and part and parcel of is essentially the same as those three, three phrases that I've used, associated, ancillary, or incidental. And in my submission, properly construed in the context of the facts of the cases that gave rise to a reference to integral to and part and parcel of the test is that integral to and part and parcel means ancillary or incidental. Not something... I repeat that again. Properly construed in the context of the, the factual matrix yeah. of the cases which arose, integral to and part and parcel of means no more than associated with ancillary or incidental. It doesn't mean anything broader than that because if it does it disrupts and is in conflict with the statutory regime. So they're, they're all, all, these are all synonyms. They're all synonyms. All synonyms in context is what you're saying. In context. And just by way of a rehearsal of what I'll come to briefly in due course, when the court considers the main cases that deal with this matter, Murfitt, Somac, Kestrel Hydro, and indeed Newbury, then all of those cases were decided in the context of the works that were sought to be included by way of remedial action through a change of use enforcement notice were ancillary, associated, or incidental works, the laying of hardcore, a spiral staircase within a building. Uh, in Kestrel Hydro, various outbuildings associated with uh, the particular use being enforced against. They were not in my submission, as in this case, works that actually generated, my words, or were the source or fundamental to the change of use. And that is where, in my submission, the limitation derives from. And so far as that limitation is concerned, uh, in my submission, there are four reasons why that limitation um, has arisen and why that limitation exists as a principle of law. Firstly, because if the limitation was not as in my submission, it was put by the judge and we say it's correct, it will effectively uh, cut across the clear differentiation or the basic distinction that Lord Mance identified uh, in um, uh, Well and Hatfield at paragraph 15 between operational development and change of use. Paragraph so, 15, you said. Paragraph 15, my lord. I think it's 15, my lord. I'll just. I thought it was 17 myself. But and I thought it was 16, so I'll ask myself to check. There or there about. Um, the basic distinction. Uh, secondly, uh, certainly in its application, it would conflict with the clear differentiation in terms of enforcement time periods between operational development and changes of use not involving dwelling houses. Thirdly, it is inconsistent in my submission with a proper understanding of the case law, or the limitation I put it is consistent with a proper understanding of the case law. And fourthly, it leads to unprincipled consequences. And if I might just take a moment to explain those unprincipled consequences. The first is that it would lead to a situation where an individual who built a dwelling house and occupied it would be exposed either to a four-year or a 10-year time period in which that building was exposed to enforcement action for removal at the discretion of a local planning authority. And that cannot be right and is not consistent in my submission with the clear principle in the legislation that there should be a finite period for removal of operational development and a particular emphasis on the finite period where that development involves a dwelling house. Well, my, my second submission on why it is unprincipled is that it gives rise to unprincipled consequences. In this case, the building of the dwelling house 
and its use led to a new use being introduced in the planning unit. That is a residential use which wasn't there before. If you consider what on, compared to this case is counterfactual, you have a plot of land that has a dwelling house in it with a large garden and a new dwelling house was built without planning permission in that garden, there would not be a change of use that would give rise to the ability to enforce in respect of a change of use of the area in which that new dwelling house was built. So the only enforcement period that would be, in which the only period in which enforcement actually could be taken would be four years in those circumstances. If they miss that, that's the end of it. And it is very difficult to see why the legislation justifiably could be interpreted in a way that allows enforcement action to be taken in respect of a new dwelling house on a piece of land that wasn't already in residential use within a 10-year period, but not in respect of a new dwelling house on a parcel of land that was already in residential use. And that leads to unprincipled, in my submission, consequences. So, Lord, that, Lords and Lady, that was essentially what we say is the correct approach. Uh, I turn then, thirdly, briefly to the legislation. Um, Mr. Simons has explained the relevant legislative provisions. I don't need to go into them in any further detail. But is there anything about his uh, description of them that uh, you take issue with? Well, but there is one point, I would say, sir, that arises. I don't think it is actually, in my submission, central to this appeal. Um, and that concerns the position of the local authority in deciding themselves what the breach of planning control is. Right. And I accept, Lords and Lady, that in the first instance, the local authority, firstly, need to decide whether there is a breach of planning control. And that, essentially, is the gateway test in paragraph 172. Has there been a breach of planning control, and is it expedient to issue an enforcement notice? That's the gateway. What the local planning authority then are required to do in section 173 is that when they issue an enforcement notice to state the matters which appear to the local planning authority to constitute the breach of planning control, that is section 173, subsection 1A. State the matters that appear to the local authority to constitute the breach of planning control. And that would involve the local planning authority setting out what it is has happened and what they say is the breach of planning control arising from those matters. But that doesn't mean that an inspector on appeal is not able to revisit how the local planning authority put breach of planning control or indeed anything following from it. And that is derived from a paragraph 100, section 174, subsection 2, which are the grounds of appeal, which are couched in terms uh, that an appeal may be brought on any of the following grounds, and then A, that in respect of any breach of planning control, which may be constituted by the matters stated in the notice. So the inspector looks at the matters, and he or she is then entitled to form a view as to really how uh, the breach of planning control should be regarded so far as those matters is concerned. So they're not constrained by the way the local planning authority put it. But that is not this case. What this case was all about and what the inspector decided it's not anything to do with the question of the breach of planning control. What he decide, decided is the extent to which, on the basis of a notice directed at a change of use, it was appropriate and necessary for the local planning authority to seek to remove operational development applying the Murphy principle. And it's in his understanding of the Murphy principle and his application of it that he went wrong. So I don't want it to be recorded that I accept the rather uh, constrained approach that my own friend seeks to uh, put to the court about whether well, the local planning authority articulate the breach, that's it. I don't accept that, but that is not the issue in this case. The issue in this case is how the inspector then approached and applied the Murphy's, which for the reasons I've indicated in my submission is wrong. Lord, just two then short final points on legislation. Firstly, the point was put um, by the senior president to uh, Mr. Simons, well, you know, what was the purpose of these enforcement periods? Well, in my submission, in answer to that point, the purpose of the enforcement periods is not only to provide certainty,
but to provide finality. Mm. And effectively, the periods provided statutorily in Section 171B in the planning context are akin and serve the same purpose as a limitation mm -hmm. period in civil litigation, yes. effectively, just to, uh, to draw an end to the matter and secure finality. <coughs> and then finally and briefly, um, Lord, Lord Justice Coulson asked about the power to vary uh, enforcement notices. That power is to be found in Section 173, Capital A, and that is a power for a local planning authority to waive or relax any requirement of an enforcement notice, including the period for compliance at any stage, whether the notice has taken effect or not. Thank you very much. And that sits alongside the power of an inspector at appeal to vary the terms of the notice when no, injustice, no injustice will be caused. That's section 176. 173A. 173 capital A. Thank you very much. And 176. Lords and ladies, as far as the case law is concerned, um, it is essentially common ground between the parties that the principal cases, certainly of relevance to the issue in this appeal, are fourfold. Um, those are, uh, in this order, chronologically, Murfitt, tab 2, Newbury, tab 5, Well in Hatfield, the Court of Appeal in the Supreme Court, tab 7 and 8, and Kestrel Hydro, tab 10. Um, before just give some references to the case law and the principles we derive from them. It is, of course, important to recognise, and the court will have this firmly in mind, that the facts in each of these cases differ from the facts before this court. And where the court is examining references in each of those judgments to what the test is, they cannot and should not be divorced from the facts that give rise to them. Uh, and as far as the facts are concerned, the reason I'll come on to a moment, um, of all of those cases in terms of their factual context, perhaps it's well in Hatfield that is the closest to this case. Now, of course, this case does not have a concealment element to it, but this is a case like well in Hatfield where a building was built uh, as a dwelling house. Uh, it was used as a dwelling house and no enforcement action had been taken during the four years following completion of the dwelling house. Before I just turn to those cases briefly, uh, the Lord the Senior President asked whether there is any case that any party is aware of where issues uh, similar or aligned to this case have arisen. There's certainly no court case that I'm aware of for completeness. The only matter that I'm aware of where similar issues arose is in the context of an appeal, an appeal I was involved in, where an enforcement notice was issued by Southam's Council in Devon relating to change of use of an agricultural field to residential. Uh, they sought through that enforcement notice to remove the tennis courts, which was the residential element. And uh, I was acting for the appellant. We took the same point that because effectively the change of use to a residential use was effectively derived from the construction and use of the tennis court, it fell outside Murfitt. Uh, it went to an inquiry. Uh, the inspector didn't deal with it because he granted planning permission under Ground A. That's the only occasion where I've seen anything, come across anything, or I'm aware of where anything similar to this has arisen. So, in short, there's no assistance to be derived from either any court case or appeal decision, as far as I'm aware. No, I mean, if, we're, if one looks at the cases, um, one can assemble a picture of the kinds of works, if I can call them that, which have been seen by the courts as qualifying within the Murphy but that's, that's, as it were, an incremental picture that builds up through the case law. Indeed. Yes, and as I'll come to in a moment briefly, uh, you can also see, albeit through dicta, not directly dealing with Murphy, but through dicta, the kind of circumstances that fell outside the Murphy approach, see well in Hatfield. And I'll come to that in a moment. Um, so far as um, Murphy is concerned, of course, you're very familiar with that case. Now it's tab two of the bundle. Um, the issue in that case, as Mr Simons has quite properly um, directed the court, was about an area of hard standing that was then laid to allow an extension of an area for use of parking of HGVs, which had already uh, commenced uh, on adjoining land. As far as the judgments are concerned, um, the judgment of Mr Justice Stephen Brown, as he then was, um, essentially uh, indicates that he considered that in principle, in principle, the removal of the hard core could be a requirement of a change of use enforcement notice, or 
albeit notably in my submission, what Mr Justice Stephen Brown does not do is explain what essentially the parameters of that test are. He doesn't accept expressly what was said to him by the Secretary of State and just says uh, it would be absurd, one nonsense, his phrase, in that case for the hardcore not to be capable of being removed through the change of use enforcement notice. So beyond that, in terms of the issues of this court, is what is the extent, if any, of any limitation on Murphitt? Mr Justice Stephen Brown doesn't assist through his judgment. Lord Justice Waller does assist, and plainly there are difficulties with the transcript of that judgment for the reasons that have already been identified and recognised. But what is quite clear from the two references within the penultimate paragraph of that judgment that Lord Justice Waller was focusing on the ancillary, his words, ancillary nature of uh, the laying of the hard court in that case. And that seemed to him to be the relevant uh, factor. And I'll say no more on Murphitt. Um, the next relevant case chronologically is the Newbury case, tab six, High Court decision of uh, Mr. Vandermeer QC, Deputy High Court Judge, but plainly one with very considerable experience in planning law and practice. Um, I could just invite the Court just to, to take up that uh, judgment in Newbury. It's in the bundle of tab six. Mm. The judgment begins at page 76 of the authorities bundle by setting out mm. in the recital the terms of the notice and what can be seen from the first few lines of the um, quotation from the notice is that it was a change of use notice, change of use of land uh, for, ag for agriculture to mixed use of agriculture and residential garden land including a tennis court used in connection with a property identified. And the requirements at C include at C2 uh, the removal of the fencing around the tennis courts and three, the breaking up of the tennis court itself. Uh, so that was the, the context. Um, the issue in that case brought by the local authority against the inspector's decision, the appeal having been dismissed, is that applying the Murphy principle, the inspector should have regarded the tennis court as being part and parcel of the change of use rather than operational development in its own right that fell outside Murphy. That was the issue in the case. The deputy judge deals uh, with that argument over a series, a number of paragraphs over a series of pages between page 80 of the authorities bundle and 84. Again, I'm not going to ask the court just to reread that at this stage, but just to um, alight on essentially a um, few paragraphs. And I invite the court firstly to turn to paragraph uh, page 81 and just read or reread the, um, the second and third paragraphs on that page, the second paragraph beginning of the logical extension of Mr Singh's submission. Just for the third, the, to, to the end of the third paragraph, the paragraph beginning in this case, in the case of the change of use. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lord, uh, what I can say by way of that is that is clearly a recognition of exactly the point that we uh, raised before the court, that if you take the perfect principle too far, then it leads to the kind of consequences the judge was identifying in that case and uh, indicating that he found it uh, very difficult to accept. Secondly, uh, page 82 of the authorities bundle uh, the last paragraph on page 82 beginning the clearest statement through to the end of the first full paragraph on page 83 the paragraph beginning where what was built
particular elaboration from me. Again, it is consistent in my submission uh, with um, the approach that I put forward referring to Murphitt, which is really what Murphitt was um, looking at was ancillary development, and that certainly is the way that this judge interpreted what Murphitt uh, provided, particularly Lord Justice Waller, and the way he applied it in this case. And then the last reference, if I may, in Newbury is on page 84 of the authorities bundle, the second full paragraph where the deputy judge begins turning back to what the inspector has done. I just invite the court to read that paragraph. Mr. Edwards, it's a, it's a very small point, and forgive me for not being familiar with the protocols governing the Journal of Planning Law, which yes. is what I'm assuming this is, but um, there's a comment at the end. I notice it's not a commentary, and it's unsigned. Um, does one therefore ignore it completely on the basis that it would be the work of a keen fifth former? Well, well I was going to come to that, the commentary at the end. This is the way in which the Journal of Planning Law has, certainly since I've been in practice, has, has um, presented things. There is a commentary by a learned commentator. The They're end. usually signed these days. Yeah. Um, they are signed. Actually. Well, in, I can help the court in this respect. That this comment was produced by Professor Michael Purdue, who was the editor of the Journal of Planning Law at the time. And Professor Purdue was, I believe, a professor of law at City University with a particular interest in planning law and was a long-time editor of the Journal of Planning Law. Now, I do ask the court to consider that commentary because in my submission it is consistent with the submissions I make. Well, speaking for myself, I read it when I read the, the, the report because one, I tend to read, if I've read a report, I read. If there's a commentary, I read that as well. But that's why I asked because I didn't know who wrote it. And I, I indeed, I thought you might say that, in fact, the uh, learned editor was my lord, the senior president of tribunals. So I, I, that's why I was quite keen to find out who it was. Well, my lord, it's certainly not the senior president no, uh, or member of the judiciary, but not a sixth former either. No, somebody with a, somewhere in between. Somewhere as well. <laughs> I'll leave it to the court. I'm so. saying nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, the only other point I would just make by way of a comment on, Kestrel, uh, on uh, Newbury is that Newbury was cited. Certain, well, if not with approval, certainly without any um, suggestion there was anything wrong in terms of the analysis by the court in Kestrel Hydro. Uh, see paragraph 29 of Senior President's Judgment. Um, I turn then briefly, if I may, to the judgments in Well in Hatfield. Um, first of all, the Court of Appeal. And I've made the point already that of all the cases, um, certainly the cases that parties are citing to the court, uh, 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 it's well in Hatfield that comes closest to the facts in this case because it was the erection of the building, use of the dwelling house, uh, no enforcement action taken against the building, and the issue uh, was the extent to which the use was lawful. Uh, as far as the Court of Appeal is concerned, uh, tab 17 of the bundle, just simply draw attention to it again, it's the dicta in the judgment of Lord Justice Richards at page 96. And deal with it very briefly. Um, in paragraphs 30 through to and including 32, Lord Justice Richards deals uh, with the argument presented by on behalf of the local planning authority that, well, we could go for the building itself under Murphitt. That's essentially the gravamen of the argument. He did not accept that for the reasons that are set out indicating that Murphy was a very different case, see paragraph 32, and indicating that he didn't consider, certainly to the extent that he felt it necessary to address it, that Murphy would extend to the removal of the building in the Well in Hatfield case. That is the conclusion at paragraph 32. I accept that this is obiter. I accept the case went to the Court of the Supreme Court and the Court of Supreme Court overturned the Court of Appeal, but not on this point. But nonetheless, subject to all of those provisos and caveats, in my submission, the 
what is set out by Lord Justice Richards in those three paragraphs is correct and it's consistent with both the conclusion of the judge and the submissions that we make to this court. That Murphy would not extend to circumstances where a building was built, in this case, and in Weather Hatfield, as a dwelling house and used so as to allow the building to be removed as a requirement of a change of use notice. So far as the Supreme Court decision in Wellington Hatfield is concerned, that's tab eight of the bundle. And I invite the court to turn on, to turn uh, in tab eight to page 113, which contains paragraphs 16, 17, and then 114, page 18. Paragraph 18. It does see, my lord, the, the, the reference I made to the basic distinction between the two types of operational development. That is towards the middle, it's, it's uh, at uh, uh, side letter D in paragraph 16. Paragraph 16, not 15, I think is what I said, of Welling Hatfield. So it's 16 you want? 16, yeah. But Lords and Lady, without taking the court elaborately through um, paragraph 16 and 17 in that judgment, uh, albeit the Supreme Court didn't refer to Murfitt, it wasn't even cited in the case, what paragraph 17 in particular demonstrates is that the Supreme Court did consider what the implications for the building would be of the approach they took to the use not being immune from enforcement. And the conclusion seems to be, which the Supreme Court uh, reached without any concern, is that the building itself would be immune from enforcement. It wouldn't have any lawful use, unless or until planning permission was granted. But there's certainly no suggestion uh, in that paragraph of the judgment or elsewhere that the local authority would seek or secure the removal of the building uh, by uh, any enforcement action relating to a change of view. That's paragraph 17. Yeah, the word section is that. So it's, it's, it's really paragraph 17 and the conclusion where the building would essentially be immune from enforcement but not the use is the part of paragraph 17 around about letter G. Mm. It's a matter of whether it actually is expedient to enforce. Yes. So essentially, th there are two points that are, in my submission, pertinent from what is set out in paragraph 17 of Lord Manson's judgment. The first is that having arrived at a particular approach where the use was unlawful, Lord Manson seems to be concluding, that is concluding, the building would be immune from enforcement because it's been there for four years. Mm. The use would be capable of being enforced against, but no suggestion that by dint of enforcing against the use, you could remove the building. And secondly, and in answer to my, uh, uh, the, the point raised about, well, the result of, of the judgment below and, and our submissions is you end up with a building with a nil use. That is exactly what you end up with, and that is exactly what Lord Justice Mance indicated would be the consequence well, of the approach he, in that case. He, he's saying that, cognizant of that, the local planning authority may may find it expedient to refrain from enforcement action. Indeed, indeed. That would be a matter of Rather discretion. than leaving a useless building. But then if it's the green belt and it says, well, this is not the perfect world, not the perfect green belt world, as it were, um, better to enforce to bring the use to an end, even if the building has to stay. So it can be dealt with. First of all, the submission I make is that there is nothing at all um, surprising that the statutory regime can give rise to buildings with no lawful use. That is the consequence of the differential enforcement periods and is also recognised expressly 
as a consequence of the operation of the statutory regime by the Supreme Court in Welling Hatfield C, paragraph 17. And that is not, as it were, an unacceptable outcome because, A, as Lord Mann says, the authority may decide it's not expedient to enforce. And in any event, even if the use was enforced against and the building was immune from enforcement, then the opportunity arises for planning permission to be sought for an appropriate use of the building, which is what happened in this case. Mm. So, my Lord and Lady, unless there be any further assistance on Well in Hatfield, I'll just deal, if I may, briefly with Kestrel Hydra, and I deal with it briefly for exactly the same reasons Mr. Simon, who is the senior president, will um, be um, very familiar with this case and certainly have um, uh, a, um, is the best person to judge what was meant by some of the references within it. Um, <laughs> but what, if I might say so, what we. That's reassuring. <laughs> What we take from the case is there is clearly references within it as to um, the scope of uh, the uh, 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 Murphy principle, and we refer in particular, as did Mr. Simons, to paragraph 28, where the principle is set out, beginning with what is the principle, it's page 176 in tab 10, and the principle is then set, set out with two references uh, within it to associated works. And we would say, in my submission, that is our submission, that is absolutely right. And the scope of the Murphy Principle is for associated works. We say that means the same as ancillary or incidental works rather than works that generate the change of use itself. And uh, so far as uh, the references um, elsewhere within the judgment, to uh, the test derived from Murphitt of being integral to and part and parcel of. Again, we would submit that so far as those references are concerned, both used in Murphitt and otherwise, they essentially mean the same as ancillary, associated or incidental rather than operational development that generates a change of use in its own right. Because if the position were to be otherwise, then as I've submitted, you would end up in a position whereby uh, effectively you know, operational development that itself led to the change of use, where that operational development itself is clearly immune from enforcement, would be at risk at the behest or discretion of the local planning authority to in being enforced against and required to be removed within 10 years. And that breaks down the differentiation within the legislation. And so far as I emphasize the point again, so far as these articulations of the limitations are concerned, incidental, ancillary, associative development, integral to part and parcel of, they need to be considered in the context of the facts of the case where they were expressed. And all of those facts are dealing with effectively development that is not the principal development leading to the change of use, as in this case, but something that is truly ancillary or incidental or associative. And it, it, the court should be cautious, and I'm sure it will be, of taking those tests out of, con out of their factual context. So, unless I have any, any further assistance, that is my submission on the case law. Turning then to the penultimate point, which is, well, what is the scope of Murphy? Well, essentially, I, I've, I've already you know, rather dealt with that. Uh, we say the scope of Murphy is to allow ancillary associative incidental development or integral development that is essentially ancillary associative uh, or incidental uh, to a change of use, not, not operational development that itself generates the change of use, as in this case. And if the court, um, if the position were otherwise, I can put it, if the position were otherwise, and for the reasons I've indicated, uh, that would lead to a result that is in conflict with the statutory regime, in conflict with the case law, and unprincipled. And what this court was very clear about, quite rightly, in Kestrel Hydro, 
is the Murphy principle was not in conflict with the statutory regime. It was a proper application of it. And to extend it in the way that it was extended in this case by the inspector would not be consistent with the regime. If I can de deal then if I may, with the decision letter, and which is in the uh, call bundle beginning at page 247. Just taking a step back from the decision letter for a moment, um, our submission to the inspector was very straightforward, that to require the removal of the Goose House as operational development in this case, given that in particular it had already acquired immunity from enforcement as operational development, was outside the moment of principle. That was the submission made, and that's what the inspector was grappling with. Now, so far as the relevant paragraphs of the decision letter are concerned, I agree with what is said by Mr. Simon that essentially it's paragraphs 60 through to 90 that are the relevant paragraphs. And in my submission, where the inspector went wrong in those paragraphs is a failure to acknowledge the legal limitation to the Murphitt principle and its application. He certainly refers in paragraph 16 to associated works as being within the Murphitt principle. He certainly refers to integral and part and parcel. And in paragraph 17, he again refers to ancillary and incidental. But what he doesn't recognize in those paragraphs as to what really is meant by those terms, and it doesn't extend to what we say uh, is beyond the scope of Murphitt, which is operational development that is that generates the change of use itself. And he seems to be suggesting that, well, as far as the test is concerned, it doesn't have to be ancillary, it doesn't have to be incidental, it has to be part and parcel of and integral to the change of use. That is the third sentence of paragraph 17, and seems then to think, well, anything goes. That integral just means anything that is effectively you know, that takes place um, uh, at the time uh, or for the purposes of the change of use. Now, that, if that is what he means, and I, in my submission, that is what he's saying, that is flatly wrong for the reasons I've submitted. That whatever part and parcel and integral means, um, it doesn't mean anything goes. And in my submission, as far as those tests are concerned, derived from Murphitt and Kestrel Hydro. It is essentially meaning ancillary, incidental, or associated development. And that is the error of law. And it is not, in my submission, appropriate or correct to categorize this as being the exercise of a legitimate planning judgment. What it is, in my submission, is an error of law in not recognizing the limitation of the Murphy approach and seeking to equate part and parcel of an integral to as being anything that was involved or took place at the time of a material change of use, rather than being what the case law does in my submission, confirm that to fall within Murphitt, it has to be incidental, ancillary, or associated. So it's not recognizing the limitation in my submission and misinterpreting the dicta in the case law. Um, unless there you any further assistance, I'll deal with the judgment if I may so briefly, um, and I can do so because essentially, in my submission, the relevant paragraphs of the judgment where Mrs. Justice Leaven sets out her conclusions, those are paragraphs 32 uh, through to uh, 39. In my submission, uh, properly and adequately address both the legal approach and properly and correctly identify what the limitations of Murphitt are. That is essentially what is set out in paragraph 39, and that the inspector erred in law in not recognizing and applying those limitations. I've already indicated that the limitation as articulated by the judge in paragraph 39, namely that operational development, which is the source of 
or fundamentally to the change of use wasn't quite the way that I put it. I put it and still put it on the basis that the limitation is where the operation development generates the change of use, but it actually makes no substantive difference in my submission because that is essentially the point of the central point. And so, Lords and Ladies, those are my submissions by way of response uh, to uh, the Secretary of State's appeal. Mm. I should address briefly the respondent's notice. Mm. Um, the respondent's notice uh, would only need to be addressed by the court if the court is with the Secretary of State uh, and against me on the grounds of appeal. Uh, that is, uh, either there is no limitation or the inspector in his decision letter did not stray beyond the limitation and that the test is in some way part and parcel and integral whole so that operation development that generates the change of use uh, or is the source or fundamental to it falls within the scope uh, of Murfit. And if that is the case in my submission in the circumstances of this case, it was just unreasonable to require the removal of a building in the circumstances by put the case on that basis. But it, I, I emphasize it only arises if the Secretary of State is successful. Uh, unless there can be any further assistance to those, uh, Lords and Ladies. So, just questions. on that last point, just so that I'm clear, that's that's covered by it's at page 86 of the call bundle, that the last page of your your skeleton, is that right? Yes, my lord. So that, that, that goes to the respondent's notice? That, is, that goes to the respondent's notice. Yep. An irrational conclusion. I mean, I recognise the, um, the threshold for irrationality, but I would submit that in this case, if we are wrong on ground one, then it would, it's just irrational. Yeah. Paragraph 59. Yeah, 57 through to 59 on page, 80, page 86 yeah. of the core bundle. Yes, Mr. Simons. My Lord, your reply. Uh, just a, f a few points by way of reply. First, on the, the issue as identified by my learned friend, um, i.e., whether there are legal limits to the application of the Murphy principle. There are, and those, those legal limits are set out in the principle itself, as expanded in Kestrel, using the Murphy principle. For shorthand, but obviously it was in Kestrel that we have a full full exposition of what that principle actually is. Um, in particular, see paragraphs 28, 29 and 30 of my Lord the Senior President's judgment in that case that the court's seen several times. Don't need to go back there. Um, but but that's, that's had a series of limits to, to the um, principle, including that the principle does not embrace operational development of a nature and scale exceeding what is truly integral to the material change of use, which is what the senior president um, thought Lord Justice Waller had in mind when he used the word an uh, uh, ancillary in the Murphy case. So my, my learned friend, Mr. Edwards, says that these, all these terms, ancillary, integral, um, part and parcel, etc., they all essentially sort of uh, add up to the same kind of thing. Uh, they're, they're synonymous, essentially, I think, was, was, the, was the submission. And, and that's consistent with paragraph 30 of, of the judgment in Kestrel. It's also consistent with the way that the planning inspector analysed the issues in this case, as I went over earlier. He expressly set out what those limits are, what the limits on the application of the Murphy principle are. He got it right. He analysed them correctly. He described what they are in, in, in the words used by, by this court. Having, having done so, uh, the application of those principles to the facts before him was, as I've said already, a matter for his judgment. The next uh, mini heading is a response to um, Mr. Edwards's suggested legal limitation on the application of the Murphy principle. Mr. Edwards endorses the approach at paragraph 39 of the judgment below. That, that's the paragraph that talks about fundamental to the source of, and I've already made submissions on why neither of those formulations is, 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 um, is coherent or indeed accounts for the facts of the cases. And with respect to my learned friend, the same point arises with his formulation about buildings which, quote, generate a material change of use. 
analytically as I've been over, it's the same sort of thing, really, as he accepted. That's just another way of saying the same kind of thing that the judge has said at 39. Um, that's not the way it works. But the, the, one development I are building in this case, it may well be integral to, it may be fundamental to, or whatever, a material change of views, but it doesn't generate anything. The, the, the building is a, is, a, is, a, is a building work. A material change of use is generated by use, not by a, not by a building. So it, again, it it is not with 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 respect, my learned friend. It falls into the same problem that that the learned judge did below, and actually trying to articulate what they say the sort of the extra principle, if you like, the extra legal limitation actually is. And again, with respect both to the judge and to my learned friend, there's a reason that uh, there is it, it, it appears to be such a struggle for them to articulate the right way of defining this legal limitation that they that they um, suggest exists. And, and that's because there isn't one. The, the, the legal limitation, uh, the, the limitation, the limits of the Murphy principle are those that the court have already accepted and described. The application of those tests, having, having, having been properly understood what, what those limits are, the application to any set of different facts is a, is a matter of judgment, not of, not of the end of law. Four headline reasons were given um, for uh, supporting Mr. Ebbett's approach won't respond to all of them, but the first one was is that it was said that the Secretary of State's approach in this case would cut across the basic distinction between material changes of use and operational development in the statute. With respect, not, not so. Um, the Secretary of State's position reflects that, and indeed is predicated on that distinction. As I've explained this morning, the starting point in all of this is to recognise what fundamentally the nature of development that's being enforced against actually is. Second of the four, it was said that the Secretary of State's position conflicts with the time period provisions at 171B. My submission is that those time periods are not relevant to the scope of or operation of the Murphitt Principle. As I've indicated already, they came along in 1992. The Murphitt case was decided in, in 1980. Looking at it in that way, would fall into the trap of elevating their importance. They're there to tell us, once you have a breach, is it too late to enforce against the breach or, or not, as the case may be. They don't assist us in identifying what the nature of the breach actually is. They don't assist us in identifying what steps, if any, are necessary to, to remedy the breach. So that they are, of course, they're, they're important provisions. Of course they are. But, but, but analytically, they're, they're not relevant to those prior questions that I say are the key questions that the inspector had to grapple with in this case. Mr Simons, just on My that, uh, um, because I've been <coughs> looking at the question of the chronology, you said, it, you said the time limit's not relevant to the Murphy principle because Murphy's 10, 12 years, whatever it is, before the time limits. Y yes. I get that, but um, whilst the time limits are, are a later creation of the four years was the four, the, the, the four and ten year time yes limit. yes the the, um, the last paragraph of the judgment of Lord Justice Waller yes where he's trying to see some logic in the distinction between the two types of breach yes that that is that that is now relevant to the time limits yes I, I, so, I don't so don't I, I don't think we can say well, Mur the time limits are irrelevant because Murphy was decided before them. No, that's the, 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 as I get it, the whole of the Murphy principle really uh, uh, arises out of uh, the judges in the Division of Court in Murphy grappling with the two different types of breaches, which yes. now have two different time limits. That, all of that is, is absolutely fair, my lord. Yeah, uh, yes. Um, the there was, of course, a time limit in play in Murphy. Yeah, it the was four a years. it was a four year time limit across, yeah. across the board, as I've said. So it wasn't that there were no time limits. I just make the point the time limits have the approach has changed in 1992. Okay. Um, but in the end, it, it matters n n not. My, my core submission is is that what, what if you like what 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 matters most the, the starting point for all of this is what the nature of the breach is. And on that, one way or the other, the, the time limits, whatever they be, four years, ten years, the same, different, um, d don't help us with that question. Um, the fourth of um, the reasons why it is said that this limitation has arisen in the way that my learned friend says that it has. 
is, is that it was said that the Secretary of State's approach leads to unprincipled consequences, and the example was given of, of an individual who is exposed, uh, who, who lives in a house and is exposed either to four, a four-year or a ten-year enforcement period uh, on, the, on the whim of the local planning authority. There's nothing unprincipled about different sorts of development giving rise to different time, time periods. That is the way that the statutory scheme works. And in this case, on the basis of the agreed facts before the inspector, the planning unit as a whole, including the Goose House, can no longer be used as a house. That is the effect of, that's not the Secretary of State's unprincipled approach, that is the approach that, that is, if you like, a common ground starting point. So it's not a, it, the, the idea of, a, of an individual being exposed to a uncertainty as to whether or not they can live in a house it is n not a function of my case. It's a function of, 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 of just my case. It's a function of agreed, of an agreed analysis of the statutory scheme. The only question is what flows from that. Can the house be removed as part of that enforcement or not? On the statutory scheme, Mr Edwards touched on it briefly. Uh, he said... And we agree that the local planning authority taking an original view, an originating view, on the issue of what the breach comprises is what he called a gateway to the enforcement process. And we agree with that. that, that, that I, I would accept that characterisation of it. I called it a starting gun, I think, earlier on. That is what gets the show on the road. He then said that an inspector can revisit the way that the, NLP, uh, that the local planning authority reached that view and the judgment they reached on that view as part of an appeal. And on that too, we agree. We agree. And, and, and I, I mentioned it in my submissions on the statutory scheme earlier. I talked about the safety valve, if you like, of what can happen on an appeal. For, for, for instance, a ground to be appeal where that issue of how the breach is described, whether it has occurred or not or whatever, can be fully ventilated as part of a planning inquiry. And indeed, I also mentioned the um, power, as indeed my learned friend did too, of the inspector to change it, so long as there won't be any injustice to either party to, to amend the description of, of his or her own motion uh, in, the, in the Act. So it can certainly be, it, the, the starting point is the authority, it's their job, but, but it can also be amended um, as a matter of the planning judgment of the planning inspector. That's the way that the statute works. But the point is, is that in the event of an appeal, because obviously not all of these are appealed, so, so on, in not all cases does a, does a planning inspector come into play, but if there is, a, if there is such, a, such, such a case which is appealed, once the inspector has reached a view on what the principal form of development is in any given case, that then is, if you like, the final say subject to it being disturbed by a court on the grounds of, of, of it being irrational or other traditional public law grounds. And that is the fundamental judgment, because it's the judgment, i.e. the judgment being what is the principal form of development. It's the judgment which determines what the appropriate time limit is, if, the, if it is, four years, ten years, or, or whatever. And it's also a judgment that gives rise to all the other things too. So, you know, what steps are necessary to remedy the breach, for example. All of that, but all of the, the other things that the inspector's got to decide. It all starts with that primary, primary judgment exercise. And the inspector's view on that was perfectly clear, as, as, as I've been over, see you in particular, paragraphs 18 and the beginning of 19, where he explains what the principal form of development was in this case. Uh, on authorities, the only authority perhaps worth responding to is one I skipped over in opening, which is Newbury. And the court's been taken to it. Just, it there's no need particularly to turn it up, because the court's literally just, just seen it. But it was... Uh, Mr Roy Vandermeer QC um, sitting as a deputy in the High Court. It's at tab six of the authorities bundle. Um, the court was shown that the judge there found it difficult to accept that a change of use to officers could mean buildings constructed to achieve that change were fell within the Murphy principle. Those comments were, as my learned friend accepted, they were obiter. They were not based on a set of facts which actually arose for the judge to decide. They were testing, in a sense, and responding to a particular submission that was being advanced by Mr Singh about uh, the purposes of enforcement. And it, it is, it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, with the very greatest of respect to Mr Vandermeer, albeit one can perfectly well understand his hesitation about getting into hypotheticals, the, the analysis in this part of the judgment 
oversimplifies the position because there may be circumstances where a building, an office building, a house, any kind of building, there may be circumstances where a building is integral to or part and parcel of a material change of use, to office use, to residential use, any kind of use. Whether it is integral, and so would appear to the authority or to the inspectors to be one of the matters constituting the, uh, the material change of use, or whether it's not integral, and so would appear to the, the authority to be development on its own, is in the end not a question of law. It's a question of judgment on the facts of each case. And it's the, as I've said a few times now, it's the foundational question of judgment under the Act for the authority to decide and then ultimately for an inspector to review on the merits. The, the, the authority, indeed the inspector's answer, that judgment will depend on any number of circumstances. And this goes to the hypothetical that my lady asked me around lunchtime which I've given an answer. It'll depend on the land, the use, the building works, any other works, no doubt other things too. But answering that foundational question, what is the development, is a matter of evaluative judgment, not, not in the end a matter of law. And as I've said already, if, if in the end the authority gets it wrong, that, that is capable of being reviewed on the merits, de novo, and corrected as part of, a, part of an appeal. Finally, on the decision letter itself, my learned friend characterises the approach taken there as, as an anything goes approach. And again, with, with, with great respect to, to him, that is, that is not a fair characterisation of what's actually said and what's done in the decision letter. And just to say it one more time, although I have in the court uh, this many times already. The, there is clear reference to all, or I think all, of the relevant tests or the components of the tests that in the end we all agree are synonymous anyway, more or less, integral, part and parcel, ancillary. The, 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 perhaps the inspector need only have referred to one of those ways of putting it, but he referred to several of them. Uh, and he reached a view having understood what those tests are, having understood that they were effectively synonymous, more or less, which is, which is the more or less the agreed position, he reached a view, quote, in the particular circumstances of the case, he reached a view as a matter of the nature and scale of a modest single-storey building in the context of a much wider planning unit. He reached a view as to what the principal form of development was in that case, and, and as part of that, whether or not other things, e.g. built construction of building, um, are, as, quote, associated works, which again I think we all agree is another way of saying the same thing. He recognised and was purporting to apply the correct legal limitations. And so, in the end, my submission is, is that the only way, therefore, of criticising him would be if, it goes back to the respondent's notice point, it would be if the court decided that this decision was simply irrational. And I say, again, with, with respect to my learned friend, that it's that it's nowhere close. Um, because, well, for reasons that are in my skeleton, but, but b because in the end, this was a detailed consideration of a range of evidence, including the, um, the, the site visit evidence under oath, on which the inspector was able to reach a careful and considered view of the facts. We've got to be, obviously, very careful about about disturbing those those judgments of fact, unless the unless the um, outcome really is egregious and it, and it doesn't come close to meeting that high bar on my submission. Unless I can assist the court any further, that that's all I wanted to say by way of reply. Thank you very much, Mr. Sam. We're very grateful to, thank you very much, we're very grateful to Council um, and those who support Council um, for very clear and helpful oral and written submission. We're going to take time to consider our decision. Uh, judgments will be provided in draft in due course for typographical and minor factual corrections only uh, and the opportunity will then arise for parties to agree the draft order, that opportunity should be taken, together with the submission of any um, 
argument in relation to matters disagreed on that exercise. Um, hand down will take place subsequently in the normal way. There will not be any need for attendance by council at the hand down. Uh, the draft judgment, I should emphasise, will carry the normal embargo. That embargo is to be heeded. If it is not heeded, there may very well be consequences for those who have failed to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you.